the mystery of Christmas, 1 Timothy chapter 3, 14 to 16. And we are going to have a word of prayer before we go there. Fathers, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you so much for today. Lord, even just the privilege it is, and sometimes we don't even think about this. We are so privileged that one more year we get to say Merry Christmas to loved ones. We're so blessed that today, perhaps we're sitting right next to a loved one. And that's because of who you are and how merciful, how gracious you are. But there are some, they're missing that loved one right next to them, right here, right now. And the joy of us is to know that they are not with us here, but they are with you. They are blessed. And as we navigate through this difficult, crazy life here on earth, I pray, Father, that in the name of Jesus, you will continue to have your way with your people. That we will grow deeper and deeper in our knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And that rather than be filling our minds with knowledge, our lives will be filled with Jesus. That every time we open our mouths, Jesus comes out. That under the most difficult and heavy adversities of life, Jesus is there. That as we're planning for tomorrow, Jesus is our tomorrow. And as we're suffering in the present, Jesus is with us. And so, Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. And as we open our Bibles, Lord, please open our eyes to see your word, our hearts to receive it, our ears to hear what you say to your church this morning. For all we want to do is to know, know you more and love you deeper. That's the purpose of our existence, and we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 3, uh, 1 Timothy, verses 4 to 16. In verse 16, what we have, and, and you know that in your Bibles, it is written kind of like in the form of poetry. And the reason it is written in the form of poetry is because this is a hymn. A hymn that church used to sing from the very beginning. We don't know how, but this became a hymn for the church. And you know, it is good sometimes to be reminded of the theology of hymns. You know, the church in the, in, in the, in the past, uh, and for those of you who remember this, you know, the singing of hymns, and it was beautiful when, you know, the one leading us in worship will say, open your hymnals to hymn 95 or 48. or You know, that was a beautiful thing. I, and I know things change and all of that, and, and I'm not here to say what was better, and that, that's, it's, that's not the point. But what I'm saying is, Hymns, for the most part, were nothing but just e extracts from the Bible. They were loaded with theology, unlike contemporary music, you know, that there's, it's just that, music. Hymns, for the most part, they, they are poetry, they are theology put in poetic form. And for that reason, we have them and we will continue to sing hymns for the rest of uh, um, our, our time here as a church. But then, then, then it, it is all hymns in heaven. And so, I mean, you, you take a look at the book of Revelation, and it, it, that's just that, worshiping and praising the Lamb who was slain and all of that. But, but there's, a, there's a, a great uh, benefit in understanding that, because this hymn here, beginning in verse 14, Paul is going to, now please remember, Paul is writing this epistle. This is a pastoral epistle. He's writing this epistle to a young pastor by the name of Timothy. Now, Timothy has some kind of personal issues, not in the bad sense, but he has some Issues about being, you know, intimidated, being kind of like, ah, I don't want to say things, I don't want to do things. He was always, on top of that, I think he had some physical challenges too, some illness. We don't know exactly what it was. But, but so that will make him kind of like timid, kind of like shy, and kind of like, and so Paul writes this to him, who is now the pastor of one of the most amazing churches in the New Testament, which, which was the church of Ephesus. But Ephesus had a very distinct uh, 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 issue here, or, 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 or yeah, a very distinct uh, existence, a very distinct uh, way of doing life as a city. Ephesus had a temple to a false goddess by the name of Diana or Artemis. 
And so in that temple, I mean, all kinds of sexual immorality, all kinds of ugly things will take place in the form of worship in Diana of the, uh, of, of the city of Ephesus. What would happen in that temple is that, you know, women will serve there uh, and not necessarily in a, in a moral way <laughs> once a year. And, and they will give themselves to immorality because what, that was a, a way of honoring Diana of Ephesus. And so what they will do is normally when they had this, this, this uh, uh, worshiping times or whatever in the temple of Diana, people will, throughout the city, they will be chanting the whole time they're on their way to the temple, great is Diana of the Ephesians, great is Diana of the Ephesians, and they will be singing that the whole time. Well, in this hymn, you're going to see that Paul kind of like picks up a little bit of that, and he writes these things to Timothy because uh, I can only imagine, and this is just speculation, that Timothy is saying, Paul, things are difficult here, man. I mean, it's week after week, I get to hear the same thing. And all these people, they are giving themselves to, do you know, this singing of great is Diana of the Ephesians. Great. And he says, even the Christians, man, they're, they're messing around and doing this thing. And that's what I think he writes this. Now listen to these verses here. Verse 14 in chapter 3, 1 Timothy. These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know, notice this, that you may know, how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God. What is the house of God? The house of God, which is the church of the living God. Which is the church of the living God. And what is the church of the living God? Well, the church of the living God is the pillar and ground of the, notice the definite article. It's not just the pillar and ground of truth. It's the pillar and ground of the truth. Who is the truth? Okay, so he says here, he says, Timothy, there's no need for you to be intimidated. Don't be shy. Don't, don't, don't run away from this. Don't, 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 don't turn your back on this confrontation. You and all the people there, you are the pillar and ground of the truth. Whatever they do, whatever they say, however they live, is nothing but deception. Timothy, be not afraid of these people. That's what he's doing here. But I want you to know how you are to... Conduct yourself. You know, sound doctrine <laughs> before duty. Doctrine before duty. You have to know before you do. You know, and this, this, is, this is in all the epistles. He says, godly living comes from godly knowing. And you have to know these things. And the church of the living God. Actually, if you read it like the way it is in the English, the church of the living God, it's actually not that way in the Greek. And I'm not here presuming that I know Greek. I don't even know Spanish. The church of the living God is not supposed to be like that. It's supposed to say the living God's church. Because the essence here, the most important thing is God. And the church is of God. It is his church. It is not the other way around. It's the nature of the church. The church is the church because it belongs to the living God. So is the living God's church. And the living God's church is the pillar and ground of the truth. Now, verse 16 says here, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. What is this mystery of godliness? And here we go. Notice there will be six words here. All of them are verbs. Six words. And each one of them has a counterpart. And you're going to notice that as I read them. Each one of them has one thing that it says, and then it has a counterpart on the other side. Notice this, six of them, six verbs. I'm going to give you it later on in the form of a word so that you can remember them easily. But this is the mystery of godliness. What is the mystery of godliness? He says, this is what is the mystery of godliness. Number one, God was manifested or revealed in the flesh. God, flesh. Look at that. Justified in the spirit. Or vindicated in the spirit. Then seen by angels. Hmm. Spirit, angels. Preached among the Gentiles. Believed on the on in, in the world. Received up in glory. Six words. And we're going to take some time to read this. We're going to see these uh, words here. Because they are amazing. Like I said. The, these six verbs here are so important to understand. What is the mystery of godliness? Number one. God was manifested, the first word, or revealed. Number two, justified. 
Number three, seen. Number four, preached. Number five, believed. And number six, received up in glory. Now, in one verse or half of a verse, you have years and years of theology. So I'm not expecting to give you all the theological implications behind any of this. But I'm going to point some things here so that you can see. Why is this? Because if we are the house of God, if we are the church of the living God, and if we are the pillar and ground of the truth, how are we supposed to do church then? How are we supposed to do church? If I go around right now and I give you a piece of paper and I said, would you please, in the name of Jesus, write here, why the church is important? I will have 300 answers. Different. Perhaps one from the other. And sometimes I think the church needs to go back to the basic elements of Christianity. Okay, so we are a church. What's the big deal about us being a church? Is it that we can get together on Sunday? Is it that we can sing? Is it that we can have friends? Now, there is a group that does all these statistics and research. It's called Barna Group. And you ask Barna Group, if you go on the website, it says Barna Group, and you find how people choose a church nowadays. Guess what's a common denominator? Number one thing they look when they're choosing a church. Parking is not number one, but it's, it's, been, it's, in the, it's in the first five. No, I'm telling you, it is. The number one thing they look for in a church is if they have friends there. If they have friends there. Second, they see, they, 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 what do they have to offer? Third, third, are they, are they uh, seeker friendly in the sense that are they not a church that is preaching hell and, and all of these things? And number five is parking. <laughs> <laughs> and I can only tell you this because, because, listen, if that's the condition of the church, we are in deep trouble. And so if I was to ask you, why is the church important? What will be your answer? I hope your answer will go in the lines of something like this. The church of Jesus Christ is the most important force in the world today. Its task is more important than all the governments and universities of the world combined. There is nothing to compare with the church. Nothing. Do you believe that? Do you believe that the church is more important than any government and any university? Okay. Why is that now? Now I, put you, now I got you in trouble, huh? You think the church is important. Why do you think the church is important? And so I, 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 in my mind, I put it as if I'm going out there and I find this older man, you know, they're walking by. And I said, hey, can I ask a question, sir? Sure, no problem. What is the question? Do you, you believe the church is important? Sure. Now, can you please tell me why do you think the church is important? This will be kind of like his answer. The church is important because the most significant event in human history was when the living God took on human flesh and lived among us as the Lord Jesus Christ to bear our sins. And since he ascended into heaven, his church now reveals him on earth, even as he revealed God when he was on earth. I'm just making up these words, you know that. And you know why I make these words? Because this is indeed... Paul's answer to why the church is important. This is what he's going to tell Timothy here. What I just read to you is adding some words to his answer on verse 16 here in 1 Timothy chapter 3. This is what Paul is telling Timothy. Timothy, listen. Listen, listen, Timothy. Don't be intimidated. Don't be shy. Don't run away from this confrontation. You are the church. You guys are the church. It's not the building. You are the church. You are the living God's church. And you are the pillar. You are the ground of that truth. And because you are that, you are the most important thing in that city. You are. And you're important because the most important event in human history was the day when Jesus came. God, who existed from eternity into eternity, he came and, and he took on flesh. And lived among us. 
Not only that he lived among us, he was sinless. And then he went to the cross to take your sin, my sin, our sins, and he paid for our sins. And then he was buried, and then he rose from the dead. And then when he gave instructions to his disciples, he ascended back to heaven. And one day he's coming again to rule heaven and earth. That is the importance, importance of the church. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Have some good chocolate and some coffee and digest that in a, in, you know, in a conversation with the family. That's what it is. Put in a single sentence, he's saying the church is important because it reveals Christ, even as Christ reveals God in human flesh. What is the mystery of godliness? That God became man in the person of Jesus Christ. Ah, that's the mystery of Christmas, church. That is the mystery of Christmas. And the church will continue to reveal Christ as Christ reveals the Father to us. The church is not a building. The church is not a place. The church is the body of believers under the lordship of Jesus Christ. That's what we are. That's who we are. We, we are people. We are the church of Jesus Christ. We are the church of the living God or the living God's church. The emphasis is on the nature of the church as belonging to God. In the book of Acts chapter 20 verse 28, he says, The church of God which he purchased with his own blood. We are that church. And he paid for each one of us individually with his precious blood. The living God's church is the pillar and ground of the truth. The pillar and foundation of the church is the truth, is Jesus Christ. And as we hold the truth of Jesus Christ to the world around us, we are indeed revealing Christ to the world. I hope you understand by now. That when we gather together on Wednesdays and on Sundays, it's not just for the sake of, I want to see my friends. I want to see. I'm going to give them gifts so they can give me gifts. I don't want to, I'm going to drink coffee. I'm going to do this. Stop it. That's not what we get together. We get together because when we're singing, we're proclaiming to angels, to principalities, to powers, and to people around here that we, indeed, we are in a personal relationship with the creator of heaven and earth and that we worship him every Sunday, not just on December 25th, that's what we do. The church preaches and teaches the truth. The church lives the truth deep in our hearts. And then we proclaim the truth as we, Paul says here, you ought to know how you ought to conduct yourself, not only in the house of God. We come, we hear, we learn, we strengthen one another, we pray for one another, we minister to one another, we put in practice the spiritual gifts that we all have, and that as we strengthen one another and we encourage one another, we send one another out to the mission field every Monday morning. And some of you coming back on, when, I mean, on Friday afternoon, wounded from the mission field, weakened by the accusations and the mistreated, and then all the things that the world does to you. And we're here leaking our wounds, and we're strengthening one another, encouraging one another, let's do this again. And we praise God, and we worship him. And as we are praying here, his presence is made known to all of us deep in our hearts. And there are tears of joy as we worship him. For him. And as we go out, we're going like, let's do this again. Let it be painful. Let it be difficult. Let it be costly. Let it be whatever it is. Let us all together preach Jesus to the world. I mean, what's the greatest need for the world today? Jesus. The greatest need still is Jesus. And so he says here in verse 16, and without controversy, this is something that is by common confession, he says. It is not subject to debate. There is no argument about this. This is beyond dispute. This is common to all believers all throughout the world. It is a unanimous conviction and confession of the, the living God's church. What is it? The great is the mystery of godliness. And how we're going to see this is, like I said, we're going to go through six words here that I'm going to kind of like quickly digest with, with, the, with all of you so that we can make some practical application at the end. We all say the same thing. All of us affirm the same truth, and this truth identifies the true living church. Not everybody in the church. What is one of the problems with the church? Is that the church is packed with followers of Jesus. Now we believers of Jesus Christ. But the truth we affirm, but us who are committed, and, and those who really believe, those who are serving, those who are going about what the Bible is all about and filled with the Spirit. Listen, listen, the, the human spirit fails unless it is filled by the Holy Spirit. Do you know that? 
And so what is the mystery of godliness? We're going to see that. Mystery, I'm going to give you three words here that we need to understand the meaning of it before we can make sense of what it says. The number one word here that I want to tell you what it means is mystery. Mystery, that which had previously been secret, but now God has chosen to reveal. There are so many things in the Old Testament that God kept secret. The identity of Messiah. How, how was he going to come into the world? And all of these things. That was a mystery. Now has been revealed. And the only way we know about this thing is because God chooses to reveal himself. You will not know anything about God. We will not know anything about God unless he chooses to reveal himself to us. And he doesn't reveal everything at one point in history or one place in particular. He reveals himself as he see, uh, as, as he see appropriate for gener from generation to generation. And now we're not talking about anything else. Mystery, that which had been previously been secret, now has been revealed. The second word here, godliness. Godliness is nothing that more than God-likeness. What is God godliness? It's God-likeness. Or in other words, it is deity, like God. And so when we talk about godliness, we're not talking about a principle. We're not talking about a doctrine. Whenever we say godliness, we're talking about being like God. And so that means we're talking about a person. But then there's another word here that is interesting. And it says here, God was manifested. That word manifested is very interesting. In some of your translations, it says God was revealed. Reveal is the word in Greek, panerao. And that means to make visible. Listen, this is important. Manifested means it was only the action of making him visible, meaning he existed in a different condition. Okay, that is important for us to understand. God, who existed in a different condition, was manifested. And how he was manifested here, it says, in the flesh. In other words, in order for him to become visible, he had to take on human flesh like us. But when Jesus was born there in Bethlehem, that was not the beginning of Jesus. He existed with the Father, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We believe that, yeah? There's no argument about that, yeah? It's, it's unanimous. This is the confession of our faith. We believe in the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So there is the Son with the Father. From, from the very beginning of all the beginnings, there's the Son, there's the Father, there's the Holy Spirit. So at one point in history, one point in time, he decided to become visible. And that's when he takes on human flesh. And we're going to see that. So what is he saying? God was manifested. By the way, you might have a, a Bible that instead of God says, he who. Does anybody has that verse like that? He who. Instead of saying God here. And because in the early manuscripts, it didn't say God. It says he who was manifested in the flesh. Obviously, we understand that if, if it is he who was manifested in the flesh, it was Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is God. There's nothing wrong with this. It's just that the translator of the, of the more newer versions, instead of creating some kind of controversy or confusion, they decided to use, instead of he who was manifested, they use now God. So anyway, now that we put those things aside and we understand that, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. Turning your Bibles quickly to the Gospel of John. Three verses in the Gospel of John. If you ever, ever have a conversation with someone that tells you, I just don't believe this thing about the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And you will ask him, well, why, why is it that you don't believe that? Well, because I, I don't know. <laughs> now, just because you don't know, does that mean that that's not truth? That's a very limited approach to these things, you know? Just because you don't understand it, I mean, if God was the size of your brain so that you can understand it, God would not be in, big enough for your problems. But don't say that to your friends, because then they're, after that, they're not going to be your friends. <laughs> Gospel of John, chapter 1. In the beginning, in the beginning was the the word and the word was with God and the word was God. now let me tell you three things about the word here okay in the beginning the word the word is eternal and the word was with God the word is personal and the word was God the word is divine so three things about Jesus Christ here number one he is eternal he is personal and he is divine how about that for a devotional huh you have six months of devotionals there. The Word. Who is the Word? We know who is the Word. 
Jesus, who is eternal. He was with God. There is a personality there. He is personal. And the word was with God. There is the divinity. The word was God. Verse 14, same chapter 1. These are my favorite three verses in all of the Gospel of John. Because you get these verses, you understand the Gospel of John. And if you understand the Gospel of John, you know what is all about salvation. And what is salvation? One word, believe. Believe. Believe what? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's just so simple. But the number one verse, verse 1 in chapter 1. Number 2 verse is verse 1. I mean, chapter 1, verse 14. And the word became flesh. That word became. That means change its condition. The word changed its condition from a previously existent one. And the word changed its condition and dwell among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 18 now, that's your verse number 3. Verse 1, verse 14, and verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. What is the mystery of godliness? Verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Jesus came to reveal the Father to us. And you move quickly. and Don't have to go there. You move quickly to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. And it says, Therefore, He is the image of the invisible God. He is the full radiance of His glory. And then later on, He's going to say, All the angels of heaven, worship Him. Worship Jesus. He is God who became men. When? At Christmas. That's the mystery of Christmas. It's the mystery of godliness. And so as we have this, the eternal word, the personal word, the divine word, who changed his condition from a previous existence, existence with God, who is a spirit. And at one point in history, he becomes flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. And he became flesh to reveal God the Father to us, the world. What amazing grace. Isn't that amazing? And so, what do we do with that? Well, he says, this needs to be without controversy. This is without argument. This is true of all Christians. This is true of the true living church of the living God. This is what the church affirms. God came into the world and revealed his holy person in human flesh. This we believe at common confession. That's what he says. So now let me give you the, back to Timothy. We only have two hours, so I better hurry up. This we believe by common confession. This is without dispute, without argument. This is true. This is unanimous conviction of the church, the church, the living God's church. And this is the great mystery of godliness. Now notice the words. Number one, the first word I'm going to give you here is incarnation. It's in verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. Amen? In a moment in time... The Son of God became what he was not. What was he not? He was not man. Never ceasing to be what he was. What he was was what? God. In a moment in time, the Son of, the Son of God became what he was not, man. Never ceasing to be what he was, God. You, know, you read 1 John chapter 4, verse 2 and 12. 1 John chapter 5, verse 9 and 20. And it says, and if you don't believe that Jesus came in the flesh, you're not in the Son. And if you're not in the Son, you're not saved. And if you're not saved, you're not a child of God. And if you're not a child of God, you're still in your sins. And Jesus says, and if you don't believe that I am He, you will die in your sin. It's just heavy stuff. The living God's church affirms the deity of Jesus Christ. So in order for a church to understand really what is the importance of the church, one thing is very important for the church, and that is the church Christology needs to be solid. Needs to be solid. Anybody, anytime that you have. And by the way, Pastor Steve says something about next year. Next year... We are going to put some people here to really get busy about some things. Now, I understand it's not a guilt trip. I'm not, I'm not saying that everybody's going to have to do something. But next year, we're going to change uh, gears here a little bit. 
we've been gaining, and please don't, 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 don't get offended, okay? We've been gaining a, a little bit of weight here, spiritual weight. It's time for us to work out that thing, okay? We're going to have to get busy. And what we're going to do here, we're going to have a series of meetings here, and we're going to give you the foundations of the faith. And one of those foundations is going to be Christology. And we're going to have four weeks at a time where we're going to take on the subject of God. We're not going to learn all, everything about God in four weeks, but you will have a better understanding. And then we're going to move to Christology. And then we're going to move to the Holy Spirit. And then we're going to move to the Bible. We want all of us to have the, the opportunity to grow deeper in our faith. Because for the second half of the year, we're going to start having mission trips. And we're all going to be part of it. And I'm telling you, church, it's time for us to get busy. Now, if you're not able to go, you will be able to send. And but I, what I mean by that, even if you just pray for someone, but you, we're gonna get we're gonna get to that point. The first Sunday of the next year, we're gonna we're gonna put together this whole thing, and we're gonna put it before God. I believe Jesus is coming soon. You believe that? I don't want us to be sitting on his resources and then waste all of that away because we're not busy with reaching out to the lost. It's my prayer that beginning the, the, the new year, once we said uh, last second of 2023, first second of 2024, now we're all praying, God, make us a missionary church. And we're going to give you opportunities, whether it will be local, uh, here in the country, overseas, we're going to have opportunities for everybody. But before we send you out, we first have to settle you in. We're going to give you the foundations of the faith. We're going to give you common ground so we can all say, okay, this is what's going to be my part. I cannot go for whatever reason I'm sending out. I'm going to be, if I'm not sending out, I'm going to be part of the prayer support group here in the church. We're all going to get busy about that. Are you okay with that? Yeah. All right. So here we go. It's going to be exciting. So the first word I give you is incarnation. Jesus Christ is the eternal God manifest in human flesh. Jesus Christ is God who was made visible. Perfect harmony. The man who is God Meekness and majesty, manhood and deity. Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 says, in the fullness of time. <laughs> and it was said in chapter 4, the son of God, born of a woman, born under the law. Christ lived as a human being, for, for sure we know that. But throughout his entire life, he was holy. He was holiness manifest. He was godliness revealed. Holy, pure, without sin. The second word that I give you there, not only, what was the first word? Incarnation. The second word is vindication. Notice what it says. This great is the mystery of godliness. Number one, incarnation. Number two, justified in the spirit. The word that is vindication. Justified in the spirit. That means justified, vindicated, declared righteous. Now, quickly, I'm just telling you this. And you have this in your, in your you're going to have this on your notes. In the Gospel of Matthew, at the beginning of Jesus, before his ministry, he goes to the Jordan River to be baptized. He's there baptized by John. He comes out of the water. And he, when he comes out of the water, they hear this voice from heaven that says, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased now. Remember that? So from the very beginning of his ministry, God says, This is my son. Now he's going to go through his ministry. Now you have to understand how dark, how hardened the heart of the uh, Pharisees that even though Jesus, I mean, the father says, This is my beloved son. In him I am well pleased. But the Pharisee says, oh, uh, but not us. We don't like him because he speaks the truth. And they're going to spend three and a half years trying to find something to accuse him. And when at the end of three and a half years they find nothing to accuse him, they, they, they will false, falsely bring false witness to accuse him of false accusations. You know that. So he says, this is my beloved son. Now, he goes through his ministry. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 says that he died hanging on a, on a cross. Now you know that the law says that anybody who is hanging on a cross is under the curse of God. Now just, just, just so that you can uh, uh, put together these things. God says, this is my beloved son. I am well pleased in him even now, right now. That's the implication, right now. But then he died hanging on a cross. So here's the religious people. And here's the, for the most part the people of Israel saying like, wait a minute. God says that this is his beloved son. How can he be that the son of God is hanging on the cross? Anybody who dies hanging on the cross is under the curse of God. They don't understand substitutionary atonement. See, those are words that they needed to understand. 
They don't understand that he is hanging on the cross, not because he is sinful, but because this is the only way to pay for your sin, for my sin. You understand that? So now he died hanging on the cross. To them, he died under the curse of God. What is God going to do about that? Well, Galatians chapter 4 is the whole chapter to say, no, he died in your place. He died because of your sin. He died to redeem you. He died to pay for you. For the consequences of sin, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. He died so you didn't have to die under the condemnation of your sin. Go to Romans chapter 1. Really quick. Romans 1. How, how is Jesus then vindicated? He is the Son of God. But he died under the curse of sin because he died hanging on a cross. So what do we do with that? It, it kind of like was a legitimate question for them. The Bible says, no, he died as a substitutionary atonement. What does that mean? Still is the Son of God, sinless. How do we know that? Chapter 1 in the book of Romans. This is beautiful that you have in your notes, okay? I, I, you might not like to write notes. Today you have to, that one in particular. Write it in the back, the one sitting in front of you. Write it somewhere, but write it down. <laughs> Romans 1, this is very important. Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. Check this out. Which he promised before, God promised this gospel before, through his prophets in the old scriptures. Concerning who? His son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Here we go. Who was born of the seed of David. He was human after all. He was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. Verse 4, here is the vindication. And declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. How? By the... So this is God's testimony, okay? This is my beloved Son. I don't think so. Look at him. He's hanging on the cross. Wait and see. The game is not over yet. And on, on a beautiful Sunday morning, ta-da, the tomb is open, and it is empty even today. And what happens? Jesus says, now you see me, now you don't. And here it is before hundreds and hundreds of people. And he says, look at my hands. Thomas, touch me. And God says, this is my final verdict. This is my final word. I said that he was my son, and I am well pleased on him. And this is my vindication of my beloved son. I am raising him from the dead. And there he is. And not only that, he says, I'm not done yet. I'm taking him up to glory. And it's not over yet. One day, whether you believe in him or not, whether you like him or not, whether you pray to him or not, whether you like his name or not, whether you say whatever you said about Jesus, God says, one day I'm bringing my son back and he's going to rule the whole world from Jerusalem. And we say to that, Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. So was he vindicated? Of course. And by vindicating Jesus with the resurrection from the dead, God says, so the Jewish people, they're wrong. The Romans are wrong. And he says, and all of you who don't believe in my son, all of you are wrong. Because it ultimately says what opinion really matters is the opinion of the Father. So the incarnation, number two, the vindication. Number three, man, I better hurry up if I want to finish this. Number three, it doesn't have much to say here, but number three is observation. He says here, God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, and seen by angels. I can only say about angels here, from the very moment when Jesus is creating all the universe, because Colossians says that he created everything with the power of his word. I, I, I believe the angels are, and Jesus said, uh, planets, and there they are. Stars, and they are in awe. Now, one thing about angels is that they don't know personal redemption. They don't understand. They don't, they, they don't know squat about redemption because they cannot be redeemed. And so they see that he creates everything, and, this is it, and everything is beautiful, and out of the dust of the earth, he creates a man. And then on one of his side, he creates a woman. And he, create, and he sees these two individuals, and they're like, what in the world is going on with these two? kind of weird. They're not like us. I mean, what are they doing? One, one day they see them, and now they see that they are hiding. They see God walking, and they're this, and the angels are scratching their heads like, what's wrong with these two? Really, you think you can hide from him? He knows everything. He sees everything. 
Oh, they are. And they are wondering what's going on here. From that moment of creation, they, here are the angels just watching Jesus. But then the wonder of wonders. One day he, 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 he takes off from heaven. And he comes to earth. And they see him. They're with him everywhere he goes. And they're following him. Where's he going now? Where's he going now? Where's, where's he doing now? What? What? A little tiny baby? I mean, they are just going nuts. Peter says, I mean, these guys are, I mean, the angels are looking at it. And they are, I mean, most of them, they're just scratching their heads like, what's going on with these people? They don't understand that. And then things get really ugly. This tiny little baby is walking around and doing all kinds of things. And there they are. And they see him in the desert, in the wilderness. And they are there to minister to him. And then they see them. They see him walking and touching people. And they are healed. And the storms, and he comes a storm. And he, he's got power over death. He's got power over nature. He's got, and they're just following him. Until one sad night. One sad cold night, they find him in Gethsemane, on his knees, in great agony, and he's crying out to his father. My father, if it's possible, let this God prosper me, but not my will, but your will be done. And now they're like, what's next? I mean, how ugly can this get? This is ugly already. No, it's not. Oh, they see him. In chain. And now they see these nasty, filthy Roman soldiers beating him. And he's bleeding to death. And they're there. Not one, not two, not twenty, not hundred. Thousands of them watching the whole thing. And all they want is for him to say, okay, it's over. Come and take care of this. And they will act immediately. Peter comes in, he pulls out his knife and he says, I'll defend Jesus. And Jesus says, seriously, you don't know, you, you, you don't see how many angels are here. One of them is enough. One of them killed 185 men one night. And to the wonder of the angels, he's, he's just suffering. And before you know, he's hanging on a cross. And they hear him say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then they put him in this cave there in the rocks. And there they're wondering. But then on the Sunday morning, they see him. <sighs> they were there at creation. They were there during his resurrection. And they are going to be there in adoration in heaven. And all they can say at the end of all these things, he died, he rose again, he ascended up to heaven, and he's there. He comes before the Father, he takes the scroll. And they, all they said is they look at each other, as I imagine in this, because that's the only way I can understand it. All these millions of angels are watching at each other and saying, like, are you ready? Yeah. Worthy is the Lamb of God that was named. And they're going to be saying that for all eternity. They never get tired, by the way. First word. Second word? Third word? You're good. Fourth, proclamation. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preach among the Gentiles. I'm going to have to hurry up now because preach among the Gentiles. From the moment of his resurrection, he goes back to the disciples. The moment, the moment the women show up to the tomb, but praise the Lord for the ladies. The ladies show up first. And the angel says, why are you looking here who is not here? He's not dead. He rose from the dead. Now, ladies, this is what you need to do. Go and tell his disciples that they are going to see him. Go and tell them. Go to Galilee. They will see him. Who are the first missionaries? The ladies. And there they go. And immediately they do what they were supposed to do. And from that moment, now he's telling his disciples. Now he's telling this. Before you know, you have Acts chapter 2. And 120 people. And, and in the mighty move of the Holy Spirit. Now 120 people to turn into 3,120 some people. And before you know, the church is born. And here's the church now being persecuted. Book of Acts chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5. All the way to the end of the book of Acts. And the church is not only in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria. Now the church is taking over the whole world. Under the persecution of the Roman Empire. Roman Empire is gone. And the church is growing stronger, stronger, and stronger. Praise the Lord. Amen. Preach among 
the nations. In, Roma, in the Gospel of Mark, he says, go and preach. What do you think they do? The next verse says, and they went and they preached. <laughs> First word. Second word. Third word. Fourth. Fifth word. Affirmation. You there? Believed on in the world. The disciples go and preach the gospel. And they went and preached everywhere. And the Lord working with them. In Genesis chapter 12, the promise was this. All in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And prophecy is fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. We are here. And we continue to preach the gospel here. And you're here because you believe. <laughs> And we take the gospel and we continue to do that. And finally, we come to the last word that is the first one, incarnation. The second one, vindication. The third, observation. The fourth, proclamation. The fifth word is affirmation. And the sixth word is, guess what? Now. <laughs> the sixth word is exaltation. Received up in glory. Received up in glory. The head what once crowned with thorns is now crowned with glory in heaven. Christ ascending into heaven and taking his seat at the right hand of God. Uh, and when he does that, Christ exalted, is given a name which is above every name. Now he's Jesus Christ, the King of kings, heaven's Lord, and heaven's eternal light. The gates of heaven open wide. <laughs> All his work is ended. Joyfully we sing, Jesus has ascended. Glory to our King. And Jesus rules from heaven. Amen? Now here's the point I want to make with this practical application as we get ready to close this. Turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Because I have to tell you the truth. This is not something that is believed. Now, here's, the, here's, here's what I want to give you, and here's what I want to remind you, okay? As I said at the beginning, the church is the most important element in the world today, the most important body of believers, the most important congregation of people, the assembly of people. The church is the most important. Why? Because we continue to proclaim Jesus to the nations, to the world around us. Because in the church, Jesus is revealed to his people. And as he reveals himself to the people, he is revealing the Father to us, to the church, the living God's church. That's the whole point. But I know that the truth is not for all people. I know that people go to church, and they, 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 they go to church because they go to church. But there's a big difference of going to church and being the church. My desire for all of you, remember that I love you. Please remember that I love you. I don't want you to ever, when somebody asks, where do you go to church? Well, let me tell you something. I don't just go to church. I belong to the living God's church. And we gather together there in a tiny little place on Beach Boulevard. I don't just go to church. Don't just go to church. That's a consumer mentality. Don't go to church. You are the church. So how can you go to you? You never go to you. I don't go to church. I belong to the church. I am part of that church. When we gather together, we gather together at this location here. But this is important because a lot of people just go to church and they are, they, they are part of the church activities, but they are never part of the church. Listen what Peter says here. Chapter 2, verse 1. I'll just read a whole bunch of verses. Please forgive me. Therefore, chapter 2, 1 Peter Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, and, be, and evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, by chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, that he who believes in him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. 
But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. But you, you church, you right here, right now, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. Why? So that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now are the people of God, who are not obtained, have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Is that? Isn't that the point of First Timothy chapter 3? So don't just go to church. You are the church. You understand the nature of the church. You understand what it means to be in Christ, because you know Christ. If you don't know what it means to be in Christ, perhaps you're not in Christ. And if you're not in Christ, how can you respond to the calling of Christ to offer spiritual sacrifices to him? How can you do that? Well, it's not going to happen. So what is the meaning of Christmas? The meaning of Christmas is God indwells his people. God's church is the pillar and ground of the truth. The truth is not a concept or a principle. The truth is a person, Jesus Christ. That's the meaning of Christmas. What is the message of Christmas? You want to know what's the message of Christmas? You better show up tonight because we're going to be in Luke's gospel chapter 2. And he says, do not be afraid for I bring you good tidings of great joy. That today in the city of David is born to you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And so God shines the light of the glory of the gospel in the darkness of the hearts of men and women all over. But I don't want you to go home this morning thinking that this is just an unbelievable story. Or don't you see this as an incredible mystery? God is calling you. Today, if you hear his word, do not harden your hearts. I'm going to read the as, as Pastor Jeff and them come and they're going to close us out. I'm going to read to you a hymn again. Listen to the theology of hymns. I'm going to read this hymn. It was written in 1908 by, by a gentleman by the name of J. Wilbur Chapman. 1908. The title of the hymn is called One Day. Let me read this hymn and then we'll pray. They're going to close us out with this song, okay? One day, one day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as, as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwell among men, my Savior is he. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. One day they led him up Calvary's mountain, one day they nailed him to die on the tree, suffering anguish, despised and rejected, bearing, up, bearing my sin. My Redeemer is he. One day they left him alone in the garden. One day he rested from suffering free. Angels came down over his tomb to keep vigil. Hope of the hopeless. My Savior is he. One day the grave who concealed him no longer. One day the stone rolled away from the door. Then he arose over death he had conquered. Now is ascended. My Lord evermore. And this is when you get to say it at the end, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Okay, listen to this. One day the trumpet will sound for his coming. One day the skies with his glories will shine. Wonderful day my beloved ones bringing. Glorious Savior, this Jesus is mine. <laughs> Fathers, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much for the mystery of godliness. The revelation, God who came in the person of Jesus Christ to reveal the Father to us. What a glorious day. And Father, as we prepare our hearts for tonight, I pray, Lord, that the meaning of Christmas will be clear in our hearts and our minds. 
that we will proclaim the message of Christmas to people around us. And as we do life here on this earth, together, by common confession, we say, Great is the mystery of godliness, God who became man. We thank you, Lord, for this time. We thank you for this morning. But I pray, Lord, that if there is any person in here that have never come to the moment, to the opportunity to say, Jesus is not just the Savior of the world. He is my Savior, my Redeemer, my King. That I pray that person will say this morning, this Jesus now is mine. So I ask you, friend, do not harden your heart. Are you here? And maybe you've never taken the time to say, Jesus, now I know you're the Savior of the world. Now I know you say, would you please be my Savior? Would you give me the privilege of saying, this Jesus now is mine? If you're here, my friend, let me offer this prayer. And you can just pray this right in the quietness of your heart. I'm not going to embarrass you to ask you to get up or to walk forward. That's between you and him. It will be a shame, though, if you have the opportunity, if you don't. Because tomorrow is guaranteed for no one. So if you want to say, this Jesus is now mine, you can re repeat a simple prayer like this. God, in the name of Jesus, I come before you now. Thank you for revealing yourself to me. Thank you for your word that speaks to my heart. Thank you for opening my eyes to see my greatest need. Now I know my need is salvation. Your gift is a savior. Lord, please give me Jesus to be my redeemer, to be my Lord, to be my savior. Forgive me of my sin. Send me home rejoicing and singing. This Jesus is now mine. For I ask you in Jesus, Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And Father, as we go home, send us home rejoicing. Yeah, we can definitely sing, this Jesus is mine. And we can rejoice and we can proclaim this truth. And soon, very soon, we will see you personally. But until that day, we will proclaim the mercies of the God who is calling us. Because we are indeed the living God church. Here to proclaim him. His grace and mercy and the forgiveness of sin in the name of Jesus. Blessed be your name today and forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.